Yes, yes, everything is good. All right, now, now I think we, we got over the little technical hurdle. Sorry about that, but it's always something. <laughs> All right, so let's start again. Thank you very much, Fiona, for agreeing to be with us here today. I'm delighted and honored to have you. Um, I'm surely most of you know Fiona. Um, an icon in the type industry, type world. So she's, she's but still, I will say a few words. Um, Fiona is a type practitioner, educator, especially in Arabic, South Asia, and Thai scripts, based in a cottage um, somewhere in rural England, I think in Cotswold, if I'm not wrong. Yes, good. <laughs> Uh, and yes, I won't even uh, intend to list all of Fiona's accomplishments, and, um, but uh, here just a few. Uh, Fiona holds a BA in German, a postgrad diploma in Sanskrit and Pali, and a PhD in Indian paleography from SOAS. In the 80s, um, 1980s, she was the first female manager at Linotype, uh, responsible for the design of Linotype's non latin fonts and typesetting schemes. And they are also developing uh, revolutionary, I understand, uh, phonetic alphabet for the index scripts. Since 89, she has been working collaboratively on various type projects um, for Adobe, Microsoft, and the like, and many more. Since 2003, she is also a professor at the University of Reading, uh, teaching various MAs and supervising PhDs. I'm sure that's challenging. <laughs> um, she's also curator of the non latin type com um, collection there, and of course received uh, a, a ton of awards for her lifetime accomplishments. And she is principal investigator of the Leverholm funded research project, Women in Type, a social history of women's role in type drawing offices 1910 and 1990. We'll be hearing uh, about that in just a moment. And I understand, or actually um, I've seen from her Instagram, she is an impressive gardener. At least I wish my beans would look so wonderful and fresh <laughs> like yours. And I also think I, uh, I read that you like uh, baking Hungarian cakes and you said you love knitting. I mean, the jumper, the fair aisle jumper, although I'm not sure what that actually means, but I guess the pattern, right? Um, is impressive. So, yes, thank you for being us. And she'll be presenting with Alice Sawa. Alice, hello, are you there? Yes, Can I make one hello. correction? Can yes. I just make my, my, of course. Pedantic nature, my pedantic nature? I'm very honored to be here. Um, I certainly didn't invent a phonetic alphabet for okay. Indian I wouldn't dream of doing that. We okay. invented a phonetic keyboard to be able to compose. In sorry, did I say alphabet? I'm sorry about that. Yes, keyboard, Hi. of course. But wonderful to hear <laughs> you and to see Alice. Th yeah, th th thank you, Fiona. Thank you. <laughs> Alice, uh, are we, yes, are we there? You. Hey, hello, hello. Hi. So happy to have you with us as well. Um, Alice is a type designer, educator and researcher from France. She has been moving around a little bit from between Paris and London and Frankfurt and is based now in Lyon. Uh, Alice is a graduate from École du Paris and École Estienne in Paris, holds an MA in type design and a PhD in type history from the Univers University of Reading, UK. Worked as an in-house type designer at Monotype, I guess in London, is that correct? Yes, that's right. Yes. Okay, great. And teaches type design at Ecal Lausanne in Switzerland and supervises research projects at Atelier National de Recherche Typographique in Nancy. I hope my French isn't too, my kind of French it is perfect. okay. <laughs> it's very long, all these words. Okay. okay. And... Uh, but Alice is uh, a postdoctoral research researcher on the Leverholm-funded uh, Women and Type Research Project together with Fiona. 
So we'll be hearing uh, more about your project in a second. Uh, and uh, she also founded French Type, uh, type design practice, uh, doing custom projects for a variety of, of clients. And for example, the project Fawn, very impressive work. And interesting in that it's also included in, in, uh, in this collection of the Centre National des Arts Plastiques, which is a fascinating institution in France. I mean, this kind of public um, collector that uh, in, on behalf of the French state is expanding and managing you know, all these kind of French uh, national contemporary art collections which is uh, really a great, great thing, so that they include type design. No, it's, it's wonderful. Yes. We're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And you also co-edit a, a, a poem pamphlet, I understand, um, with, or po poem editions with Jérôme Nebosch. So I was wondering if you actually write poems yourself. Uh, well, the, it's called poem, but we don't publish poems. We publish oh, okay. text about um, yeah. It, it's just the name of the publishing house, but we publish text about type. All um, right, okay, okay. Then I misunderstood. All right. Well, never mind. But do you do you write poems still? <laughs> no, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think I would try. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, then um, I'll. Uh, give stage to you both, we'll play your presentation and see you in a little bit for a short QA. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our talk. Alice and I are honored and, to be, and delighted to be speaking at this Type Tech Meetup. We are pleased to have been invited to talk on today's theme of type and society in relation to our Women in Type project. And we recognize um, that all of us attending this event know the value of type design and how it helps shape our visual world and how we experience it daily in many guises. Recognizing that type design is vital to the accurate representation of languages to afford literacies to global communities, yet the role, art and process of type design tend to be overlooked in the histories of print cultures. Even design histories have largely overlooked the activities of those who contributed to type making processes, especially those of women during the 20th century, a period that saw great social upheaval and tremendous technological changes. Drawing on our experiences as, type, as designers and type historians and inspired by different people and events, Alice and I were interested in researching this area and redressing this oversight and the lack of credit afforded to women whose work was often unacknowledged or attributed to a sole male designer. Our interest eventually led to the development of the University of Reading Women in Type Research Project funded by the Leverhulme Trust. And together with Helena Leka, we have aspired to provide a reliable account of women's role and responsibilities in type drawing offices we needed to, to define a realistic scope for a three-year part-time project and base our investigations on material that was accessible to us. Therefore, the focus of the research is on the two leading British type manufacturing companies during the past century, Monotype and Lanotype. Although we have, are, of course, interested in the work carried out in other countries and other type foundries in Europe and elsewhere. In previous talks, we explained in some detail the origins of the project, our aspirations and research methods. So today we'd like to highlight some findings that speak to the themes of society and collaborative practices, and also show how such themes are illustrated on our new website. So to situate the research when viewed in the wider societal context, this period is inevitably of significance for British working women, since it begins before women receive the vote, encompasses two world wars, sees the emergence of the women's liberation movement and witnesses the first woman to win a case under the amended Equal Pay Act in 1988. We are looking at women working in industry. Even from our initial research, we could confirm that women were often central to the development of type on an industrial scale. And our period of study begins with the time when the art of punch cutting, the initial process of type making, as with other practices, no longer remained a mainstream artisanal craft, but was transformed by mechanization 
to become part of an industrial process along with typesetting. As Walter Tracy was to put it, the introduction of the punch cutting machine meant that for the first time type designs would occur as drawings on paper, which led necessarily to the emergence of type drawing offices within type manufacturing companies, such as the Monotype Type Drawing Office established in England in 1910. The principal role of type drawing offices was to produce letter drawings and re related data necessary to the manufacture of typefaces, whether in metal, film or digital format. At Monotype and Linotype, type drawing office staff would adapt a designer's original drawings to a suitable format for industrial production, as shown here. Or they would convert existing typefaces for hot metal or photo or digital typesetting. They might expand character sets to include symbols or develop other sizes or styles such as italic. And their work was not confined to the Latin script. And as we shall see, some drawing clerks or letter drawers as monotype and linotype call them, did progress to create original designs. We are following in the footsteps of design historians like Martha Scottford cited here, in that we are looking at the not so famous women to record these women's precise engagement with type design and manufacture, and to ensure that the legacy of their work is recognized as it remains evident in today's typographic practices. Through researching archival records, interviewing key personnel and examining material artifacts, we have elicited information to document working practices in type drawing offices, observing the changing status and responsibilities of women in these departments, and also how the iterative nature of type design naturally forms part of a collaborative process of type making. Over to Alice now. Thank you, Kiruna. Um, if I could just share my screen. Um, yes, I will now walk you through some of our findings. Um, I will discuss more specifically the, the monotype side of the research and then Fiona will speak a bit more about linotype. Um, so uh, first of all, you might ask why did type manufacturers employ women to work in type drawing offices? Um, it's probably worth mentioning here that um, industrial companies such as Monotype and Linotype used to sell typesetting equipment, which is the reason why they produced fonts. So the fonts uh, were sold alongside the typesetting machines. Um, Monotype had a large factory plant uh, halfway between London and Brighton in England for most of the 20th century, and the company was a major employer in the area. And as you can see on this picture, there were uh, many men who worked at Monotype. Um, here is another photograph of young men working on machine parts. And uh, what's very clear from advertisements that we found in local newspapers is uh, that the company regularly advertised specifically for boys and men to work in certain departments, uh, including its engineering drawing office. But when uh, seeking new recruits for its type drawing office and for its matrix factory, the company explicitly advertised for girls. Uh, the uh, intelligent girls aged 16 to 18 who had to be good with arithmetics, lettering and so on. And as you can see from this picture here, the, the company employed many young girls who were in charge of producing, checking and sorting the type matrices that were sold alongside the monotype machines. Um, so the women sitting in the first two rows were here on, on that picture were working in the type drawing office, uh, which means that they were making all the technical drawings used to produce hot metal typefaces. Um, uh, these women were hired as drawing clerk and they typically joined the company after attending grammar school. Um, they had to be skilled and meticulous and they were seen as precision workers. Um, and the decision to hire female drawing clerks to work in the type drawing office was most probably driven by uh, financial reasons, as uh, women could be paid lower wages than men. Um, so the archival material reveals that before the Second World War, um, average wages at Monotype were higher for men than for women, significantly higher. Um, and so while wages seem to have been below average for most women uh, in the company, it was still perceived as a company that uh, took good care of its employees, regardless of their gender. I think that should be mentioned. 
Um, and so most uh, women worked in the drawing office for a few years after leaving school, um, and they usually left the company when getting married or starting a family. Um, so uh, this meant that uh, the turnover was uh, quite high in the drawing office. Uh, that encouraged the maintenance of low wages because women couldn't really build a career. And I should say that some women did occasionally pursue long career at Monotype, uh, as, you, as we will see. Um, and so one of the reasons why uh, most women left their positions as drawing clerks was because it was common practice for women at the time to give up their job once they got married. Uh, in fact, in the, uh, until the 1970s in the UK, uh, many employers applied what was called the marriage bar, which prevented married women from working. Um, the practice was made illegal in 1975. Uh, from our research, it would appear that Monotype did not apply a marriage bar, uh, as some of the women who worked there did keep their job after getting married. But there seemed to have been a, a general expectation in society at large that uh, women would give up their job upon starting a family. And I just wanted to make a point here about the fact that uh, we as researchers uh, had to be very careful not to apply our own views and perspectives onto historical facts. Um, in that respect, it was really interesting to speak with Patricia Saunders, who worked in the TDO for many years. Um, and Patricia had joined uh, Monotype as a drawing clerk in the 1950s. Uh, she met her husband, David, at Monotype and left uh, when getting married and having children. Um, but unlike the majority of her colleagues, she did eventually come back many years later in the 1980s once her children had grown up. And when we interviewed Patricia, she was very clear about the fact that she was not forced to leave her job. She felt that it was the right thing to do. Uh, she said she believed in equal pay for equal work, but on the other hand, uh, she thought women uh, now tried to have it all. And she said, you know, I wouldn't have wanted to work when my children were young. Um, she also mentioned that uh, women didn't want to take on supervisory roles, even if they had the opportunity, and that she certainly never wanted to. Um, and so that's something we probably didn't expect to hear, and we had to be very aware of the different mindset of the period. Although um, some women did take on supervisory roles, uh, in fact, what we observe is that uh, when women made a career for themselves within the TDO, it was most likely because they remained single and had to make a living. Um, so I would like to mention here more specifically two women who seem to have been uh, very important actors of the monotype drawing office and were highly valued members of staff. The first one is Dora Pritchett here uh, uh, with the circle. And the second one is Dora Lang. Um, both stayed with the monotype for many years and became important figures of the drawing office. Uh, they both also remained unmarried and supported a widowed mother. You see them here again a few years later. And here again, that's the photo we saw earlier. Um, so uh, Dora Pritchett joined uh, Monotype in 1908, age 22, and she was still with the corporation 30 years later when she would have been in her 50s. Um, we believe that Dora Pritchett was a valued member of staff. She was living in one of the few company houses near Monotype. And when the company celebrated its 40th anniversary, she was given a seat at the central table with the corporation's highest managers. You see here Dora Lang uh, later, at a later age, at her drawing table, uh, probably in the 1950s or 1960s. Um, Dora Lang was the head of the drawing section of the type drawing office, uh, and she left a lasting mark on her colleagues. Um, she joined Monotype in 1922 when she was 16, and she stayed with Monotype until her retirement in 1966. So she stayed with the company for 44 years. And uh, we were lucky to interview a number of people who were trained by Dora Lang, and they made very clear that she had so much knowledge and played an essential role in passing on that knowledge from one generation to another. Um, in terms of uh, career opportunities, of course, things evolved as uh, societal changes took place. Um, there seemed to have been a clear culture shift in the 1970s, both at Monotype and within the British society at large. Um, yet it is interesting to note that even when um, I interviewed uh, Valerie Wise, uh, who joined the company as a young woman in 1959, 
one can see how personal circumstances played a role in, in uh, professional ambition. You see her here uh, photographed at Monotype alongside her colleague and friend Daphne Lovegrove. Um, she explained to me how uh, getting divorced and supporting her two daughters became an incentive to build a career for herself. Um, she had joined Monotype um, in 1959, met her husband at work, which happened very often, uh, apparently, uh, at Monotype, and she left a couple of years later to start a family. Um, when, so Valerie got divorced, she returned to Monotype in 1973 to work as a fonts development technician in the digitizing department. Um, eventually, she became the supervisor of the digitizing department. Um, and by then, um, she was the main breadwinner and was keen to take on more responsibilities. So uh, she said that being in a more senior role gave her confidence and that she never felt that she was discriminated against because of her sex. I would also like to um, get back to Patricia Saunders uh, because she is somewhat an exceptional uh, character. Um, so as I said earlier, Patricia joined Monotype in the 1950s as a drawing clerk, and she said that when she started out, the, the drawing clerks were not encouraged to know the name or the history of typefaces, but she did build some solid interests, knowledge and skills in type design. Um, she left uh, shortly um, after getting uh, married and came back in 1982. So she had left the company when its main activities still revolved around hot metal. But when she came back, she was asked to uh, adapt and develop typefaces for digital for the typesetting for the monotype laser comp. Um, Thanks to a number of societal, cultural, and also technological evolutions, when, when uh, Patricia came back in the 1980s, she was able to work on new type designs. Um, she explained that this required her to fight for her status and her pay. Um, she, she said she even threatened to quit at some point as she felt she was treated unfairly compared to her male colleagues. Um, but she did eventually get a raise and she did originate a new designs. Um, she's known for having developed Ariel with Robin Nicholas. Um, she designed other typefaces, including uh, Columbus, uh, and she's credited as being its designer in marketing materials. So um, it's interesting to see um, uh, that it did become possible for a woman who had initially been hired as a drawing clerk to become a credited type designer who originated new designs. Um, one final point I, I wanted to make before handing over to Fiona, um, and I think this is something we have found from both ex-monotype and linotype type drawing office members, um, is that very often the women who worked in type drawing offices um, do not see the value of their contribution. Um, they only worked there for a few years from, for many of them, uh, many of them changed career, so they feel they didn't really contribute to anything. Um, they also fear that their memory will fail them or that they won't have anything interesting to say. So this was probably a challenge we didn't expect and that made it difficult to track down some of the women we were keen to interview. Um, this is also um, where it was very helpful to interview some of the men who worked with them to get a different perspective on, 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 their, on the work and contribution of these women. Um, so, for example, we interviewed David Saunders, Patricia's husband, uh, who worked also in the type drawing office, and he explained how uh, these women needed to have a sense of proportion and difference. And he said the human eyes seem to be very good at differences, and these people needed to see to see it to see differences in large amounts. Um, um, I think this is also summed up very nicely in an article published in the Monotype Recorder in 1956, where it explains that uh, TDO members had to use critical imagination and that the work required a most perceptive effort to interpret and realize the designer's true intention. Um, it also required a certain exercise of judgment and a great deal of accumulated knowledge. And uh, we also got uh, uh, similar information from an interview uh, I did with Mike Fellows, who worked with uh, uh, the Linotype Typography Department, uh, who said, uh, to my mind, the Cheltenham Type Development Team, so at Linotype, were all creative in varying degrees and with varying skills, uh, some artistically creative, some more technically creative, and Fiona will tell us more about this uh, in a minute. Um, but just to, to say that the issue of skills is really something we have tried to investigate as part of this research and uh, trying to understand what were the skills required to work in a type drawing office. Um, and I think, you know, it was often assumed that these women were essentially doing a technical job, that they were 
there to execute technical drawings, where um, in fact our research demonstrates that their role was more one of interpretation than merely execution. Um, and yes, I will now hand over to Fiona. I share the white screen. Yes. Well, as already indicated, we um, are not looking for female counterparts to the male heroes that have populated the history of type, but we do want to show that women have played a significant role in type design, even if they've not been named as prominent type designers. And furthermore, with this project, we aim to demonstrate that type design generally relies on some kind of collaborative process and has done so throughout history. And this is illuminated by a case study I have been undertaking, that of tracing the origins and development of the Linotype Devanagari digital fonts. As many of you know, Devanagari is a script used in South Asia, particularly in India, for writing Hindi, Marathi, Nepali, as well as Sanskrit and other languages. And this map shows some of these scripts employed by millions of readers in India, with Devanagari being used by the greatest number. A notably successful rendition of the Devanagari script in type was effected by Jawaji Dadaji Chowdhury, shown here, and his type foundry established in Mumbai in 1864, and which is evidenced through the high quality publications of its accompanying Ninaya Saga Press. The types became known as the Ninaya Saga types. And it was these types that formed the models for the Devanagari fonts of mechanical typesetters that were introduced into colonial India in the early 1930s by both the monotype and linotype companies. Introduced at the instigation of determined personalities in South Asia and prompted by commercial interests while drawing on resources from England, America and India. However, mechanical typesetting severely compromised Devanagari textual composition. Monotype fonts could include up to a maximum of 255 characters far fewer than the customary 600 used by Ninaya Saga. And the linotype machine only had capacity for 90 characters in the main magazine, with some additional available in a side case. Well, comparisons with type foundry type were thus inevitable, but neither company could meet monotype's criterion stated here of producing Devanagari type that was indistinguishable from foundry type. And the last few lines here read, in such a degree as the machine lowers the standards created by the slow evolution of manual methods, it must be pronounced a failure. Well, it should be noted that hand composition as well as lithography continued in parallel with the introduction of newer technologies for rendering Indian scripts in print. And really it's worth stating that during this time, type manufacturers produce fonts which could only function on their proprietary equipment. So a linotype font, whether metal, film or early digital, could not function on a monotype machine, an aspect that did not change until the development of cross-platform fonts as used today. Of course, there were some not always legitimate exceptions. Well, furthermore, due to the various specificities of Indian scripts, even across linotype machines, font when, fonts were not interchangeable, particularly due to the keyboarding. And these English language machines shown here on their way from the factory to Bengal would not have been able to set Devanagari or Bengali. So here we can note how the keyboard and its method of accessing characters became central to the typeface design process. Now ample documentation exists of these hot metal Devanagari developments brilliantly written up by, by Bar Singh. An archival evidence which is more geared to production output and sales issues than to type design processes reveal that different iterations of both the monotype and linotype fonts were developed with constant comparisons made to the Ninaya Saga types for well over 30 years. And the Linotype archives hold copies of this printed comparative typeface sample showing a 1962 iteration of the hot metal Linotype Devanagari type set along with the identical text composed with the Ninaya Saga type designed by Ranoji Raoji Aru and with the hot metal monotype Devanagari that you see in the middle. Now this sample illustrates the disparity between the different composing systems and their consequent effects on the aesthetics and readability of the different type designs. So I think you can perhaps see the different textures produced on the page, largely due to the fitting, as well as some of the character shaping. 
and the extracted words on the right reveal the different character shaping of the second character, Kra, which is rendered quite differently in all three settings. Now, this sample shows that actually the monotype composition to be certainly superior and closer to that of foundry type than what the monotype machine could achieve, which, as its name suggests, set lines of type and actually could not kern. Well, although linotype set Devon Argery gave a somewhat broken appearance to reading matter, as can be seen from such statements as quoted here on the right, it was preferred over the monotype for newspaper composition since it could cope with the pressures of rotary printing. Consequently, the hot metal linotype Devon Argery fonts saw considerable use over several decades and could be said to have redefined what was to become acceptable as legible typography in this script. And it has been noted, not least by the exceptional Beatrice Ward, erstwhile publicity manager of Monotype, that the customary practice of type founding companies was to copy existing successful designs when converting from one technology to another. But conscious of the poor aesthetics of its hot metal Devanagari in the 1970s, Lanotype once again turned to the Ninaya Saga types to form the starting point for a new Lanotype Devanagari typeface for the VIP film setter. And this project was to be supervised by Walter Tracy, then manager of the Department of Typographic Development at Lanotype Paul Limited in London. Now the artwork was to be produced by the type drawing office in Altrincham near Manchester and the fonts manufactured by Mergenthal Lanotype Company in America. However, a pressing schedule led Tracy to commission the renowned British type designer, Matthew Carter, to undertake the typeface design work. And here you see in his youth below. Well, it was not a direct revival, rather Matthew achieved a skillful modern rendition of the Ninea Saga types, which although constrained by a limitation of 150 characters, showed huge improvements over its predecessor, not least with the introduction of kerning. There were character set restrictions because there was still a one-to-one -one correspondence between a font cell and a keyboard code. And the design was warmly welcomed in India, although complex keyboarding procedures inhibited its use. Well, this VIP development laid down the foundation for the digital version, also called Lanotype Devanagri, created by me and my team at Lanotype in consultation with Matthew and Lanotype colleagues in India. With a background in languages, including Sanskrit, I joined the company as a research assistant. And research was instrumental in taking the design forward and it underpinned all the designs undertaken in the Department of Typographic Development in the 1980s, which had relocated to Cheltenham and comprised the letter drawing studio and R&D staff. Well, crucial to the digital design was the development of new keyboarding procedures and therefore composing methods devised in collaboration with software engineer, Dr. Mike Fellows. So here, the invisible hand of the programmer was essential to the creation of new artwork because it facilitated the inclusion of over 300 characters in one font. And in short, specific, it allowed specific character selection software to provide access to an array of contextual forms far greater than the number of codes on the keyboard. It enabled the precise positioning of subscripts and superscripts and generous kerning in two directions. So the phonetic keyboard, as it was called, was first implemented by Ananda Pazar Patrika in Calcutta in 1982 for setting Bengali, Devanagari and English from one single standard keyboard. And it was revolutionary for its time, providing unprecedented freedom to the design of new Indian script typefaces. Regarding the typeface, Matthew Carter was remarkably open to revisions suggested by me following consultation with my Lanotype colleagues in India, particularly Bala, shown here on the top right, and also his associates who were in close touch with the needs of their mainly newspaper clients. The majority of the redesign and addition of over 200 original characters was to be carried out by the studio, the type drawing office. But research has shown that due to a staffing shortage at the time, Matthew undertook more of the design work than I had recalled. In July, 1980, Matthew here lists having provided 171 characters in the lightweight and 173 in the bold weight. And the great remainder of the work was undertaken mainly by Georgina Sulman who was to become head of this restaffed letter drawing studio in 1982, and whom we were able to interview for the Women in Type project 
in 2019. And here Georgie is seen working on a Gomoki script design. It's important to remember that all artwork needed to come through the company drawing office for type manufacture. In fact, during the 1980s, only three external designers, all of whom had worked at Minotype, namely Walter Tracy, Tim Holloway, and Matthew Carter, they were the only ones who supplied artwork that did not require redrawing for font production. The Devon Agri artwork was always reviewed by the department for subsequent font developments, such as Postscript, and screen shapes and lookup tables were undertaken by Ros Coates with me. And incidentally, Ros did not wish to be interviewed for our project, but she was happy to respond to our emails. So in conclusion, the creation and production of the Linotype Devonagri digital fonts resulted from international collaboration. And those engaged in their development were keenly aware that they were not only collaborating with their immediate colleagues, but with unseen hands across the centuries, stretching back to the days of Ninaya Saga to help provide a better shape to the reading experience of millions across the globe. However, inevitably, many hands continue to remain invisible. Over to Alice now. Thank you, Fiona. Um, I will now uh, say a few more words about our outputs. Um, yes, uh, I'll just to briefly mention some of our recent publications where you will find many more details about uh, our findings. Um, our first article was uh, published last year in Journal of Design History by Oxford University Press. Um, it's entitled The Women Behind Times New Roman and, and relates to the activity of the monotype type drawing office in the late 1920s and 1930s. Uh, Fiona and I are also very excited to have contributed a chapter to the Baseline Shift book edited by Briar Levitt and uh, recently published by Princeton Architectural Press. Um, and in this book, our text highlights the career of some of the women who worked in the monotype TDO, in particular, Dora Pritchett, Dora Lang, Patricia Saunders, whom I mentioned tonight. And uh, Fiona has written up a, a fascinating peer-reviewed case study on the development of blind type Devnagari, so in relation with uh, what she presented tonight. Um, the study is to be presented, to, to be published, sorry, imminently in the Journal of the Printing Historical Society. Um, and it highlights the importance of uh, crediting invisible hands across time, as, as Fiona has uh, mentioned tonight. Um, we're currently preparing a text to be published as part of a book called The Edinburgh Compa Companion to Women in Publishing, uh, to be published by Edinburgh University Press. And um, I should also mention here that we have a research blog uh, where we uh, post very uh, irregularly about our research and about various events. Um, but as we progressed and as we uh, collected uh, some uh, rather fascinating material and in particular many photographs, um, it felt uh, increasingly necessary for us to find a more uh, visual and more interactive way to share all this research material uh, beyond the blog. So. I think also, especially as COVID uh, hit and prevented us from holding a couple of exhibitions and talks that we had planned, uh, we really felt the urge to conceive a different platform that would come as a complement to our talks and publication and that could act as some kind of um, uh, visual online display of our findings. Um, so Fiona and I worked on this with Mathieu Trier, who is a creative technologist at the BBC and also works uh, occasionally as a freelance designer. Um, and so together we devised a, a new website, a platform that um, hopefully feels less academic and more accessible um, than, than our uh, articles. Um, and that uh, enables uh, uh, visitors to navigate through our research findings in a visual way. Um, so the website presents a curated selection of the findings and of uh, the archival material we gathered during the course of our research. Uh, everything is arranged in themes. Um, hopefully the navigation should feel uh, fairly self-explanatory. Um, and yes, we hope that the website will provide visitors with a rounded view of our findings through a, a non-linear way of, of um, navigating the themes. Um, I should say that in terms of content, it is still work in progress. Um, we're very pleased to use the typefaces uh, Gig by Francisca Weidgruber and uh, Grotesque Sis by uh, Emily Rigaud. 
Uh, this is an example of, a, of the article page from the website. Uh, so you can see um, how the uh, images uh, alongside the text um, uh, work. And we reference the idea of looking through a box of old photographs. And uh, we really try to communicate the richness of the archival material we have gathered. Um, some of the articles also contain audio and video extracts, which you, which you can uh, play uh, directly on the website. Um, we have uh, made sure, of course, that the website works both on desktop and on mobile, so you have two slightly different uh, systems to navigate through the articles, depending on the device. And um, another important part of the, of the main page was to show our reading list, which contains uh, very useful references that we use during the course of the research. Um, so much like the rest of the website, it, we lead with images, um, and we, uh, we've also arranged the references uh, thematically so that people can look for a specific literature on women in design and publishing, women in industry, type design history, or women's history. And uh, of course, the, the colophon uh, provides um, all the uh, information about the website and about our research project. Um, and I would um, yeah, encourage you to, to uh, go online and check it out by yourselves. Um, this is uh, the address of the, of the website. And that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting us. Yes, uh, thanks to Type Tech Munich Meetup and uh, uh, we're ready for your questions if you have any thank you thank you very thank you very much fiona and alice for this wonderful enlightening talk so let's see if there are any questions um, at the moment on the chat i don't see anything so keep them coming i'll i'll have uh, a couple I was wondering, uh, listening to you at the beginning, talking about the uh, drawing office, um, how actually the um, kind of working at the drawing office for a moment, how, how that was regarded in social environment. So saying, I mean, what, um, how, was, what, how, how well respected was it for a woman to, to work at a monotype drawing office? Alice can speak for monotype. I'll speak later for the linotype. Yes. Um, so what we know about the monotype side of things is that it was really interesting to hear from interviews uh, that we held with some of the women and some of the men who worked in the drawing office. Um, in the type drawing office were really seen as kind of uh, precision workers. And uh, there was a... Um, uh, we were told there was a kind of an unspoken distinction between the women who worked in the matrix factory, uh, which were doing a job that was really assimilated to factory work, whereas the women who worked in the type drawing office were seen as uh, skilled. And, you know, as, as we said at the beginning of the talk, they were, uh, the uh, monotype was explicitly recruiting women who, was, who were uh, intelligent and good at arithmetics or good at lettering. So uh, there was a level of skills that was um, uh, acknowledged, I think, uh, for precisely the work in the drawing office. Fiona, you can probably tell more about the linotype side. Well, I mean, our linotype um, information is from much later. And, um, but I can say that, I mean, one of the things was certainly in the 1980s, which for some people is a long time ago. <laughs> um, really, we got a we received a lot of respect and the women in the drawing office received a lot of respect. We, we happened to be all women. It wasn't intentional. We happened to be all women. Um, and we received a lot of respect from the people, uh, from the software team that supported us, from the, the, um, our colleagues in India in particular. Uh, but uh, within the company itself, um, I think Georgie Silman said, you know, that we were sort of treated as, you know, the girls who did something up in that room on, on the top floor. You know, there was there was very little respect. They didn't really know what we were doing and didn't appreciate it. The, the gender balance was very different. I did hire graduates, which Walter Tracy disapproved of. He said they'd only questioned me, which I thought was actually a very good thing. He used to just um, hire school leavers. Um, and um, so I think the people we respected respected us. 
but the rest of the company didn't seem to really know what we we're doing. But in India, we didn't have that problem, though. I mean, the gender balance was very different. I, I went to the railway workers uh, printer conference, um, 300 men and me. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's, I think it'd be uh, now. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, must have been a kind of a strange <laughs> feeling, perhaps. <laughs> Okay, let's see, any, any more questions? Uh, all right, perhaps people are a little bit shy, I don't know. Anyway, I have one more. Um, you were saying that Dora Lang was uh, very active. Now she was also very, very long at the Monotype at the drawing office and kind of involved in um, training. Is there or are there any writings by her? Did she do some kind of manual or, or did she have, uh, what kind of tools would she be using? Um, yes, actually, so uh, the, the knowledge was essentially passed on orally in the drawing office. Mm. So there wasn't, Dora was training, uh, you know, young recruits by showing them how to do the work. But uh, it seems that as she was approaching retirement, uh, Monotype realized that she was she had so much knowledge and sh she was key to passing on that knowledge. So um, we don't know how things happened, but we found in the archives a, a little book, which is, I think, from 1956 or 58. I can't remember exactly. And uh, it's called something like how a font is produced for Monotype use. And it's all it's a it's a quite a thick notebook. And it's entirely written in uh, Dora Lang's hand. And uh, so she gives a lot of, you know, what we would receive as essentially technical knowledge on how to make the drawings and how to adapt, you know, what will be the consequence of certain decisions on the drawing uh, for the actual metal type for the matrices and, and so on. Um, so we have this little notebook, which uh, is, a, it was, is really a gem and... Um, uh, we have photographs of it. We didn't show them tonight. We did show them in some other talks. Uh, and I think we show a couple of, of images on the on the website, actually. Great. There's also something else which is quite interesting, which um, Vaibhav Singh turned up um, in his, um, which is that in the work log notebook in 1931, and I've got the date here, the 26th of November, Dora Lang notes that she worked on, well, the drawing office worked on the Devon Argery because they are saying that the, these companies had the drawing offices to process artwork um, from designers or whoever delivered the artwork in order for font manufacture. So that iteration of the monotype issue, that was actually done through the monotype drawing office supervised by Dora Lang. So it's- Wow, it's okay. Yeah. Wonderful. So, well, thank you very much also, for, I mean, generally for, for your talk, of course, but um, for this, this project that um, really the, the voices and the work and uh, the women involved in these companies um, are, are coming to life and are, are, are giving the right uh, and the proper spot in history. So thank you very much. And we see you both later at the panel. Yes. Mm -hmm.